Thank you, God. I'm grateful to know him, aren't you? I was thinking tonight how grateful I am that my entire family's in church. My whole little family. And I'm so grateful. So grateful to God for answering that prayer and moving in my family. and Because I was standing up here when we were singing and I'm thinking, it's so nice not to have to worry about running back there and turning that down or <laughs> blaring your all's ears. Steve's on it. He's taking charge of it. Um, that's just a plus. Um, I'm truly grateful that he knows Jesus. Amen. Sorry. That he... Um, has committed fully to the Lord, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm just going to, hopefully won't keep you too long. I'm just going to share with you what the words that the Lord had given me. It was Thursday morning, Wednesday night, Thursday morning. I didn't sleep well. I was wrestling with that headache. So I was up and down, and at some point Thursday morning, I remember waking up, and I heard the words, I come in the volume of the book. And I, I remember thinking, wait, is that scripture? I was like, I've read that. And I was going to write it down, but I fell back asleep. And when I got up, I couldn't remember what it was. I remember it was something I, I, I told Steve, I was like, I can't remember what it was. I and and the word, I was thinking it was the word or, or something. And I remember telling dad that morning, I was sitting on the porch studying and trying to remember where it was. And he called and I said, I can't remember. I know, I know, I know it was the spirit of the Lord. I know he, I, I know his voice. I know. And it, not like I heard him audibly, but he just drops it in my spirit. And it was so plain. So. And it wasn't until Thursday night on Hal Drennan, I remember right where I was, and it was just me and Allison because Steve was in Moorhead and um, Alara had stayed home. I was on my way to get dad, and I remember going, that's it. I told Allison, I said, text me these words. (laughs) So, you know, I was driving. I wasn't going to try to type it in my phone, but so I wouldn't forget it again. I come in the volume of the book is what I heard. So if you go with me to Psalm 40, there's only two places in Scripture that that phrase is used, actually that the word volume is used. And Psalm 40 is where I went first, so let's go there. <clears throat> and I talked to the Lord, and I was like, what is it you want to say? <laughs> so I've been studying, and hopefully he'll bring it out, what he wants to say here. Well, let's start at verse 5. This is a psalm of David. And he says, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. And isn't that the truth? The blessings of God, the wonderful works, are more than can be numbered. In verse 6, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And I was thinking, you know, that's a psalm of David. But. He has to be speaking of Messiah there. He has to be speaking of Jesus because especially, you know, like in verse 7, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. There's nothing in the books at that time when David wrote that. There's nothing in the books written about him. What he's talking about, that's Jesus. He's pro- it's a prophetic um, word that because this entire book is Jesus from beginning to end is about my Savior. You'll find it in the Old Testament. There's, they speak of a Messiah. They talk about it. Isaiah prophesies about it. The Psalms prophesy, talk about it. David was moved upon by the Holy Spirit to write these words. And I believe this was, these were prophetic words of my Savior. 
And he says, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. So the only book that David had at the time would be the Pentateuch or the five books of Moses, the, the book of the law is what they called it. So the spirit of the Lord is saying there that even in those books, it's written of Jesus. It's written of, of one to come that would deliver from sin for, for good. Amen. Amen. And here in the um, Psalm 40, that word volume in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word is megala, the, the law of Moses. Um, go with me to Hebrews 10. This is the only other place that that phrase is. In Hebrews chapter 10. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> We're going to start at verse 1. I'm going to do a little bit of reading here. In Hebrews chapter 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers there into perfect. Couldn't make them perfect. They had to repeat it. Daily, the priests offered sacrifices, sin offerings, and love offerings, and, and other kind of oblations in the temple the priests would offer for the people. But it had to do it continually. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. So there, he's saying, it, wouldn't it, if, if it cleansed for good, they shouldn't have to do it continually. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou, ha thou hast not had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So, Jesus is what David was speaking of. And the Spirit was saying through David that Jesus was mentioned you know, the, uh, let me get to this a volume when we think of volume and I don't mean like turning up the volume I know that's probably what Stephen thinks when you say volume because he likes to turn knobs um, but it's also considered in this context a collection of books okay that's what we, we would say a volume is it's a collection of written or printed sheets bound together or a book so in the only book that David had Jesus was mentioned, maybe not by name, Amen. maybe not by his, actually Jesus is from the Greek translation, he was actually called Joshua in Aramaic, if I'm not mistaken, y'all can look that up, if I need correct it, I'll correct it, but I'm pretty sure that's how it was, we get the Jesus from the Greek, but he was spoken of back in the time of Moses, and then here, the writer of Hebrews tells us that he was the better sacrifice, that those sacrifices and offerings that the priests offered continually, that the people of Israel offered continually, they didn't do any good in making, getting rid of their sin for good for once and for all. But Jesus, who's mentioned all throughout, who's talked about in creation and, come, and forward, he was there, and he came, Jesse, 
to be the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. And that's what it says for over here. I'll read on verse 10. By the which will, the will that he's talking about, God's will, in verse 9, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Who's that? You and me. You believe in Jesus. You believe he is the son of God. You are perfected. And that's that's not the word that the world wants to use. You know, this perfect person. I don't know that there's, there is no such thing. Perfect in the word, the way we're talking about it is mature in the love of God, mature in your relationship with God, that you know who he is and you know his will and you know his ways. Amen. Amen. And we are perfected forever, not just for a week or a day or a month, forever by what Jesus has done. That's why I'm always saying, don't take lightly what Jesus has done for you. Because he replaced all those daily sacrifices his one offering and the body that that God gave him he perfected it was a perfect sacrifice and once and for all and we are free from sin shouldn't we be shouting the rooftops off that I am free from sin because of what Jesus did he bore my punishment like we sing in that song thank you Jesus for the blood he took my place in that to- that borrowed tomb. That's where I belonged, Hope, because of my sin and my wretchedness. But he took my pain, my punishment, and my sin, and he bore it on himself. And once and for all, he paid the penalty for the entire world. Don't take lightly what Jesus has done. He's been around, and I will get to this here. In fact, he says in... Um, I want to read on before I get ahead of myself. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and get this. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. And I love what my Ryrie says down here, and I'm going to quote it. He says, Christ's redemption needs no repetition and no supplementation. Therefore, a rejection of his sacrifice is final and unforgivable. And I like the way that he put that. Because there's nothing I can do to supplement what Christ did. My works are not going to make my salvation any better. Not going to, like dad says, my works aren't going to make me any holier. The blood has already made me holy. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that makes me pure and holy. Amen? Not my works. Now, granted, like Tina was preaching to you the other night, and there's another message that God has got on my heart that will come about works, but that wasn't where he wanted to go tonight. So, Yes, we have to do good works. That's what we're called to do. He created us for good works, is what he says in Paul says in Ephesians. And we are to do those things, but that's not what saves us, Nikki. And when we understand that what Jesus did at Calvary, that was one and done. He doesn't have to repeat it. Nobody can add to it. Nobody can take away from it. It was the ultimate payment. He paid my debt. He paid a debt I couldn't pay. Don't take lightly what Jesus has done for you. And I was thinking about the verse in John chapter 5 where um, Jesus is talking to the the Sanhedrin or the, the Pharisees in the temple and they're questioning him and, well, let's go there and just read it because I didn't write it all down and I don't want to misquote here. But they're quizzing him. You know. 
who do you think you are? <laughs> They're seeking to kill him because he'd not only broken the Sabbath, my goodness, but he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So if you look over in chapter 5 of John, verse, start at verse 39, Jesus says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus there himself, he said, they, the scriptures that you live by, they're talking about me. It may not come out and say Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, but it's talking about the Messiah, the deliverer that Moses spoke about would come. He said, I'm he. And he goes on to say, and you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. Ouch. I am come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses in whom you trust. <laughs> For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Ha! How about that? Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. For lo, I come in the volume of the book. He was there from the beginning. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? He was telling them. He said, the scriptures speak of me. And yet they believe not. And... They had the words right in front of them. But then when Jesus stepped up, they had the word right in front of them. Have we been like that? How often have I had Jesus standing right in front of me, offering me peace, love, contentment, and yet I knew better. I can find it over here. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm not, I, I'm not worthy. No, no, no. I'm not worthy. I can't take that. I wonder how that made him feel. I've thought about that because what a price he paid for me. And then I refuse his gift. My God. I beg forgiveness. Don't you doubt it. God, forgive me for the times that I didn't just say yes, Lord, and receive your precious gift. Like Jen has preached to you before, grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Jesus paid the price for it, and he's wanting to give you the gift. But so many refuse for that one reason. Oh, I'm, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve that. No, but take the gift anyway. <laughs> It was, a, it was a priceless gift. Don't refuse it. How would that make you feel if you went out and spent a lot of hard-earned money on a very nice gift for someone you love deeply and then they refuse it? Think about it. How would that make you feel? He paid the ultimate price for us. And the scriptures speak of him. They testify of him. How amazing is God's word. And I was thinking about it, that it all goes back to a pure heart, Dad. Because I know we've been talking a lot, and well, Steve and I have been talking a lot about fasting here lately. And, you know, just the basics and, and, and why we do it and whatever. And like the scripture there says, and so often in the Old Testament, you hear God saying, your, um, your sacrifices and your offerings are a stench to me. Why? Because they would come and make their offering, but they're over here worshiping Baal. Or they're over here worshiping the God of the Chaldeans or, the, or whoever they might be hanging around at that, that time. So their, their offering, their sacrifice was polluted. And, and I often think about it, how God just simply desires truth and sincerity, a pure heart. 
Because I can fast my brains out, but if I'm not doing it for the right reason, less like dad says, well, you're just on a hunger strike. If it's that, and that was the message when I was preaching about a pure heart. That's what God is saying. He's really trying to get this across. That everything, everything you do flows out of a pure heart. Seek him consistently. Check it every day. And again, I'm not to check Nikki's and, and I'm not to check Cindy's or anybody else's. I can't. It's not for me to do. I can only pray for them. But my heart, the purity and the sincerity of my heart is on me. That's between me and God. But it is of vital importance that you ask God, what were my intentions in doing that? Was I just trying to get a pat on the back? Or if I do that, am I just wanting to be seen? Am I fasting just so I lose a little weight on the side, you know? <laughs> Or am I truly doing it to give up something just to be closer to God? Truth and sincerity is what God desires. It's what he is truth. There's no falsehood in him. And, and think about it. You and I, we all have those fake friends. You know that to our faces, they're like, oh, I love you, Nikki. You're just the best. And then they go off and, and they get with another crowd and they they downer. Everybody's got those friends or, or those ones that only come around when they need something. My mower's broke. My weed eater's broke. Arnold, can I borrow yours? Um, but do you know what I'm talking about? Fake friends. They say they're your friend, but when that really comes down to it, they're going to leave you high and dry. Do you treat God that way? Do, do we treat God that way? That we just come to him when I need delivered God. I need this. My, my, my kids need food or, or I need these bills paid or, or I've got cancer. Now I need you, God. What about all those years before? Didn't you need him then? That, that, it kind of hurts his heart, I'm sure. Because he feels, says he's a jealous God. He gets angry. I'm sure it hurts his heart. But he desires truth and sincerity. So again, check your heart. He doesn't want just the mere performance of religious rituals. You know, like we come in to church and we, we pray. I, we're not ritualistic here, but like a lot of the Catholic churches you know they do their communion and their mass and all that and then they go out and they cuss like sailors i know some but and i don't get it there's no heart change just going through the motions and god doesn't want that look what jesus did look look what god did from the beginning of creation, he had this plan laid out so that here in 2022, hope you'd be sitting at church on the rock and falling in love with him again. Praise God. Thank God. Don't, don't take lightly what Jesus has done. The price that he paid for you to be here, for you to get to hear the good news, the gospel, that, hey, God loves you enough to die for you. Amen? What a great God. And if you read there in, um, well, no, it was that place over in, in Hebrews that it actually is quoting Jeremiah 31, and I was going to read that. So go with me to Jeremiah 31. And it talks about the new covenant. But I don't know. I can't remember off the top of my head the years that Jeremiah lived. Well, actually, I could tell you if, according to Ryrie. It's a long time before Jesus. I know that. It says the book of Jeremiah was written. Hang on. They date the book of Jeremiah 627 to 585 B.C. So that's a long time before Jesus. But listen to this prophecy. 
that God speaks through Jeremiah. We'll start, it's chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of, out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, by the way. <laughs> it doesn't say, by the way, that was me, but although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Because here, listen to this. For they shall all know me. For they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. How awesome is that? Thank God that he is a gracious and forgiving God, that he would remember our sin no more. That he'd be willing, he knows all the wrong we've done and all the horrible things we've done, but he chooses to forgive us. If we'll ask, you gotta ask. Because he had this plan laid out from the beginning of before time was. What an awesome thing, our, our awesome God, our creator is. Amen. I just, I'm blown away by that, that, you know, he wants all to know him. Not just the priests, the Levi, of the tribe of Levi. Do you know that? That there are 12 tribes of of. Israel, sorry, I'll get out in a minute, but only the tribe of Levi, that's where the priests come out of. Those were the only ones allowed in the temple. Think what a blessing we have now. We are the temple of God. <laughs> that God would leave his throne to come to earth as a man, to die in our place, and make it so that he can dwell in our hearts through and by the Holy Spirit. He dwells in us. The temple of God is you and me. Do you delight in his will? Jesus did. He delights to do the will of the Lord. Do we delight to do the will of the Lord? Sometimes I ask myself, do I delight to do the will of the Lord? Or is it a burden? If it's a burden, it's a sure sign that your heart needs checked. It's a sure sign that your heart is lacking a little purity there. Because if we truly love and honor God and want to honor God, doing his whatever he's called us to do, like getting up here, this should be a delight to me. And honestly, I couldn't wait to share this with y'all tonight. Because I thought this was so cool. I love the way he speaks Amen. to me. I love it. And thank God he brought it back to me because I went back to sleep and forgot it. Amen. But lo, I come in the volume of the book. He is from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. My Savior. Amen. He's right there. Don't think, Amen. don't count, count it small what Jesus has done. Amen. Please. Value your salvation and treasure it and delight in doing the will of the Lord. And God will be pleased. He just, he longs for a relationship. That's the ultimate end. And once you have the right relationship with him, it's like I was talking earlier. Once I understood, Dad, that he just wanted to, he, he just loves me. He does. Stop telling me I don't, you know. Stop arguing with me. It'd be like my child. I'd be like a Laura saying, when I tell her I love her, no, you don't. I'm not worthy of your love. After a while, they'd get on my nerves. I'm surprised God lasted as long as he did with me and didn't strike me down. Because for so long, Dad, I doubted his very words. I did. I didn't think I was worthy, Nick. I didn't think I could do enough. Didn't think I was special enough to deserve to be loved by the great creator. But I don't have to be special. I just am loved. 
And that's brought such joy, such peace and contentment. You want peace? Let God love you. Get to know him. He says, in fact, in Jeremiah, that that's what delights him, is that you know and understand him. Isn't that a relationship? That's what a relationship is. Yes. He wants you to know and understand him. That, that makes his heart happy. That's what I think of when delight. It says delight. The Lord delights in this. It makes your, his heart happy. You want to make God's heart happy? Just long to be in his presence for no other reason than you love him. You all, you, every one of you have friends and family. Those certain people that, that doesn't have to be a reason. You just enjoy being in their presence. Amen. That's all God longs for with you. He wants you to love him back that way because that's the way he loves you. He just wants to be in your presence. And from the beginning of the book to the end, Jesus is involved. Like I said, he may not mention him by name specifically, but Messiah, the great atonement that washed away all our sins once and for all. And nothing I can do, Jesse, can add to that sacrifice. I can't make it any better. It's perfect. Amen. I'm glad I don't have to. Amen. Aren't you? That takes a weight off. Amen. My gosh, this gift that he has given us. Amen. Aren't you grateful? Amen. Salvation is such a gift. And I'm so grateful. And now we're going to have a test. I'm just kidding. We're going to have altar call. <laughs> Every scripture that I read, what was it? Where were we? <laughs> no, kidding. Hey, I kid you not. I remember. Oh, yeah, Steve's got his notes. I remember when Aunt D sat up here and read Psalm 27 and then quizzed us on it. I got a hundred. <laughs> Amen. Jen's got it all written down back here. We'll give you a hundred tonight. But if everybody would stand. I don't mean to make light of the word of God because it's important that you know. It's important that you know that you're important. And that you were worth, like I said earlier, that you were worth dying for. And I'm so grateful. Don't take it lightly what Jesus has done. Lo, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will. And I'm so grateful that he was willing to do God's will. <laughs> Amen. Let's find us a place to pray tonight. <clears throat>